the definition of ploidy is simply the number of chromosome sets. Sets, right? And so in humans, right, in our somatic body cells, we have, we're diploid because we are 2N and that's going to equal 46. And so we know our haploid is going to be 23 because 46 divided by 2 is 23, right? So we have 23 pairs and we have a total of 46 chromosomes. This is a chromosome. Then we said this during anaphase, when they're being pulled apart, we're saying that these are two chromosomes. Okay, so let me clarify that. Right here, we're looking at one chromosome. Chromosome. Over here, we are looking at what are these two structures? What do we call this? They are called sister chromatids. Sister chromatids. So when your singular chromosome replicates, you're going to have sister chromatids. Okay? So when the sister chromatids are still connected at the centromere by the cohesin proteins, right? This is still considered one chromosome right now. One chromosome. Okay? But when these chromosomes in anaphase, when we were talking about it in mitosis and in meiosis, when they split apart, now we can officially consider them as two separate chromosomes. Now this is considered two chromosomes. And this will make more sense as we get into meiosis and mitosis. And then let me quickly draw right here. So let's assume these are the same size. Right here, we would consider these two chromosomes as what? These are considered homologous. Homologous chromosomes. One of the copies is from your mom, one of the copies is from your dad. So that's why they're homologous chromosomes. They're coding for the same thing. So if we're talking about ploidy, okay, so we have 23 sets of chromosomes. I think that's clear with everyone, right? And so we have one from your mom, one from your dad, okay? And that's how we get 46. So our N is equal to 23. And then if we count these individual chromosomes, one, two, three, four, and so on and so on, we're gonna get two N is equal to 46, okay? Now, like I said, this image, these are replicated chromosomes, that, that which means that they are sister chromatids. So it actually is less X, right? But you can barely tell it's an X, but this one structure right here, right? It's an X, it's, they're replicated, okay? So if you considered this as two chromosomes, right? Which is wrong, chromosomes, right? That's wrong. Because if we consider this as two chromosomes, if we started counting every single one as that, would be one, two, and then this would be three, four, and so on and so forth, right? And then you would get what? 90, I think it's 92 chromosomes. So you can see when a chromosome is connected by its centromere and it's replicated, it's still considered one chromosome. So I'm going to repeat this because it is a little bit confusing. This is definitely not easy to understand the first time. So this karyotype, it's showing 23 chromosomes in our um, body. Okay. And so say this is going to be, I'm going to redraw the karyotype with my colors. Okay, so this is going to be chromosome set one. Okay, two, three, four. I'm going to show four for now, but imagine it was going to 23. All right, and then we'll say that this is going to be our second pair. I'm just drawing all these chromosomes as the same size, but different colors. Okay, so we'll draw this one as large. We'll draw that one as super large. And then we'll do another pink one. We'll do like a little bit intermediate. Okay. So imagine this is the first four chromosomes we're looking at on this karyotype. Okay. So what I'm trying to tell you here is the difference between one chromosome and two chromosomes. This right here, okay, when I, what I circled, how many chromosomes did I circle? I have only circled one chromosome, okay? Yes, it looks like two, but when the sister chromatids are connected by the centromere and it looks like an X, 
when it's still connected, this is considered one chromosome, okay? It's just replicated. If we considered it as two chromosomes, it would be wrong because then you would have to count all the individual lines. So you'd be counting one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, so on and so forth. And if you did that, you would count uh, 92 chromosomes, right? But we're right now saying that we have 46 chromosomes. So that means when you have an X, that's still considered one chromosome. All right. So prophase is going to be our first step of our mitosis. Okay. And we're going to see that our nuclear envelope is going to start to disintegrate. So I'm going to show it by these dashed purple lines. Okay. And so for our example that I'm going to go through for mitosis, we're going to say our cell has two N equals six. So that means we have six total chromosomes that I'm going to draw. And that means we're going to have N equals three, which means it's going to have three pairs or three sets of chromosomes. Okay. So I'm going to get started with drawing those chromosomes. So the chromosomes in prophase are going to start to condense. Okay. And you can see them in a light microscope. Okay. So I'm going to draw our chromosomes. So this is one chromosome and I'm going to draw its homologous pair in red. Okay. And so the reason I'm drawing its homologous pair as the same size is to indicate that they're homologous to each other. Okay. So the size in my drawing is related to them being homologous. Okay. You have those two. Okay. And then these are not necessarily lined up in any organized fashion during prophase. So this one's a little bit bigger. So the green and the orange will be homologous to each other. And then we'll draw our last ones. Let's draw them significantly bigger. Let's draw, use, what color have I not used? We use dark blue or purple. Okay. So this is going to be our chromosomes in our prophase. Okay. So I drew them lined up to, with each other. Um, I don't like that actually, because they're not lined up. They're going to be, they're going to be scattered about, to be honest. So I'm going to draw this right here, significantly bigger. And let's like this. Okay. So during prophase, our DNA is going to start to condense. The spindle centrosomes are going to move to the opposite poles, right? So you're going to start seeing your, uh, your centrosomes start moving to opposite poles. Okay. They're going to replicate. And then you're going to see these on the opposite sides and the responsibility of the centrosomes, all right, are to use these microtubules that we're going to have to start connecting to the chromosomes and it's going to eventually line them up and also pull them apart. Okay, so that's looking at prophase. So prometaphase, um, essentially what's going on here is that our nuclear envelope has completely disintegrated. Okay, so we're not going to be seeing our nucleus right now because it's been disintegrated. And then we're going to have our chromosomes. Let's draw them. And they're going to be floating over here. Two. We said orange and green were together. So the orange one and the green were intermediate sized. And then we said the yellow and the purple are going to be the much bigger ones. Okay, so our two n still equal our two n still equals to six. Okay. So what's going to happen is that our centrosomes are going to be releasing those microtubules and they're going to start connecting to the what? What do the centrosomes connect to? There's a certain word that the, there's a certain word for the microtubules that are going to be connecting to the chromosome. And there's a certain part on the chromosome that the, um, that microtubule is going to attach to. So the microtubule kinetochores are going to be attaching to the chromosomes and they're going to be attaching to the second word I wanted to, for you guys to know is the centromeres. They're going to be, they're going to be connecting to the centromere, which is that part of our chromosome. Remember that? So the kinetochores are going to bind to it. Some kinetochores called non-kinetochore microtubules, so they're not really kinetochores, they're called non-kinetochore microtubules, like this orange line I just drew, are not going to actually connect to a chromosome. I forgot to draw a line for that one. Um, and those are just going to be called non-kinetochore microtubules. The purpose of the non-kinetochore ones are going to be explained later in our anaphase. Okay. 
But in pro metaphase, just so you know that they're connecting, they're going to start connecting to the chromosomes. Okay. And so now we have our metaphase. Again, 2n equals 6. Let me draw this dashed line. What is that dashed line trying to represent? Very good. They're going to be the chromosomes are now going to be lined up at the metaphase plate. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six. Because so we're going to have six chromosomes. One, two, three, four, five, six. So I'll draw those lines clearer for you after. So we have our homologous chromosomes. But what you need to understand in, meta in mitosis is that it doesn't matter if your chromosomes are homologous or not homologous, all the chromosomes are going to line up at the metaphase plate. That's what you guys need to understand. Every single chromosome is going to line up one on top of the other. So orange, and then I believe it was, yep. Yeah, I used the wrong color for that one. Okay, so these kinetic cores are going to start attaching to the centromeres of our chromosomes. And they're going to line them up at the metaphase plate. So anaphase is going to be straightforward as well. We're just going to be pulling apart those chromosomes. But let me just draw the picture first. What type of protein is involved in causing the chromosomes to split apart? So cohesin is the protein involved keeping the two sister chromatids connected to each other. Motor proteins are responsible for causing this force, this pulling force, that's going to pull apart these chromosomes. Okay, so there are motor proteins involved. So on our kinetic or microtubules, we're going to have proteins that are actually going to pull apart, pull in opposite directions, and they're going to cause our chromosomes to split apart. So that is important to know. We're also going to have, remember our non-kinetic core microtubules that I talked about earlier? Those non-kinetic core microtubules, which are not connected to any chromosome, are actually going to help stretch and uh, elongate our cell. So I'm not drawing it in this picture, but imagine, uh, I'll just draw it right here quickly. So imagine more of those orange lines that go straight across. Those non-kinetic core microtubules are going to be responsible for elongating the cell. Okay, I'm going to start describing the ploidy. Okay, so remember when we were talking about 2n equals 6, right? Everything was 2n equals 6 for all of these. When anaphase is involved, it's going to be a little bit different. It is not 2n equals 6. Okay, 2n equals 6. It's not the case right now. Right, so we're still looking at one cell. Okay, how many chromosomes are present? Remember, at the beginning of our workshop, we said this is considered one chromosome, but when we pull it apart, now it's considered two chromosomes. So how many chromosomes have I drawn in this picture? I've drawn 12 chromosomes. Very good. So we still have one cell, right? But we also have 12 chromosomes. So this just seems a little confusing, but it's, it's as straightforward as, as it sounds. We have 12 chromosomes in one cell. And remember, n is equal to 3. And if we have 12 chromosomes, 4n is equal to 12. During anaphase of mitosis, all right, write this down or pay attention to this line. During anaphase of mitosis, our cell is technically temporarily tetraploid. Okay? So it's tetraploid during this stage. Tetraploid. We haven't done cytokinesis yet. So we have only 12, we have 12 chromosomes in this one cell. And so technically speaking, during anaphase of mitosis, we are tetraploid. Now I will move on to telophase and cytokinesis. What's going to happen is that our nuclear envelope is going to start appearing again, right? And then in each cell. And during 
telophase, if your if your cell has not completely split yet, if we're considering it as one cell still, then the tetraploid conversation applies to telophase as well. But if we're considering it going past cytokinesis and it's been split into two cells, then your cells are going to be diploid. So we have those six chromosomes in that nucleus that's developing. And then we have these six chromosomes that are going to be in this nucleus that is also developing. Okay. And then eventually, I'm not going to redraw these chromosomes into the two cells, but you're, you're going to see that eventually you're going to have two full cells, each with six chromosomes, right? And they're going to be in what stage of the eukaryotic cell cycle. So these cells that are newly made are going to be in our G1 stage. Okay. It's, it's pretty straightforward, right? They're, the cycle has now restarted. Okay. So this is cytokinesis. Okay. And our cells have completely split. We have, again, 2n equals 6 in these new cells. And during telophase, since I have not drawn my cell as splitting yet, we're technically still at 4n equals 12. 